And there were just so many years where I was just like, oh my God, like, why am I, su- like, why? Why do I have to suffer this much? What is this for? Like, there has to be something. And it kind of feels a little bit like this coaching is the answer to that. This is Rebel Therapist, a podcast for entrepreneurs who are trained as therapists and who want to level up their businesses, make a bigger impact, feel fulfilled, and be very well paid. I'm your host, Annie Schusler. Before we jump into this conversation, if you're wanting to build a business that doesn't rely on you working full-time in your private practice anymore, where you have another way of working that you really enjoy and that pays you well and allows you to lean into a topic you care about, it's time right now to get on the wait list for Create Your Program. We're going to be enrolling in early January, starting on January 2nd. So go to rebeltherapist.me slash create and get your name on that list so that you know right away when we open up. There's going to be a special offer if you sign up in the first days of enrollment, and I don't want you to miss that. And I know this is a really busy time of year, and maybe you're like away from your email a bit more right now and good for you. So get it on your calendar that January 2nd is when the doors open and you can get that special offer. Create Your Program is a 10-week process where you're going to get my step-by-step help to get an amazing program going in your own business, like the one that Samantha is about to talk about. I want to see your name on that list so that I can help you create your signature program. So go ahead and pause this and go to rebeltherapist.me slash create and get on the list. And if you have any questions about whether CYP is the right fit for you and your goals, email me at info at coachingwithannie.com, or you can jump into my messages on Instagram, into my private messages, and you can also get on Zoom with me if you'd like to talk it through. So I want to help you make the right decision. All right, now let's talk about Samantha and hear this conversation. So Samantha Fox has shrunk her therapy practice way down and is no longer taking any new therapy clients. She's really delighted that her business has transitioned to mostly her coaching programs. And she's found that she's got abundant energy and love for serving in this way. And She's also discovered that the free stuff she provides on social media and on her site, not only does it help grow her audience and help people sign up for her programs, it also helps many queer women live truer lives, some of them who she never meets or gets to work with personally. So that is just one of the ways that the work that Samantha is doing now is a much better fit for her life than a full-time therapy practice was. As a sexuality coach, Samantha works with women worldwide to support them as they discover that they are not as straight as they might have thought. She's developed an experiential method called Unbox Your Sexuality that creates a monumental transformation. This method helps women in unpacking, unlearning, and relearning schemas and narratives that we carry with us due to being born in a patriarchal society. All right, let's jump in. Welcome, Samantha. I'm so excited. Hi, Annie. I'm so excited to be here. So tell us, who do you work with in your programs and why those folks? Yeah. So I work with women really from the ages of 20s into the late 60s, um, so really wide span, who are either questioning their sexuality, curious about their sexuality and just never really had a safe space to explore that, or women that are coming out. And all of these women have lived a life of um, either dating, partnering with, uh, marrying men, and actually also some who have been asexual. So it's a pretty wide range of women. Awesome but in this very particular niche. Yes, they're all curious about their sexuality and having some feelings of same-sex attraction and, you know, kind of struggling with that. Mm-hmm. And why why that group? Why have you chosen that niche? Well, 
I am a late bloomer myself, so I went through this. I lived through this. I came out at the age of 32 when I had three kids under five, had been married to a man for seven years, and um, met somebody that kind of blew my world up, and then I blew my world up, and have lived the last 22 years uh, kind of, you know, just processing and connecting the dots and trying to understand myself. I became a therapist and work with people in this area and also just, um, just you know, anything sex-related, sex therapy and things like that. So it's just, it's an area that I'm very curious about and also one that I have personally experienced and lived through myself. So I feel like I, I'm um, extra able to guide people on this journey. Yeah. And what's it like for you kind of being somebody who is in your niche or like has been in your niche and being out there, like being really visible for being so queer and like having at least an outline of parts of your personal life kind of out there? What is that like for you? Yeah. I mean, interestingly enough, um, when I first started working with you, when I first met you, I was very introverted. Uh, I still identify as an introvert. So it was hard initially to put myself out there. And I have found over the last couple of years that it's very freeing. Mm. I feel so free to be me. I feel I have completely exited any boxes that society has tried to place me in. And I feel so proud to be queer Mm -hmm. and kind of screaming queer (laughs) everywhere I can. And and just like this platform to really um, tell my story and have a voice about it after many years of really being in survival mode after going through my own coming out process. So it's been very healing and very full circle for me. Mm. So do you think that the process of getting more visible in your work has kind of developed that muscle more? Yes. So it's almost like I'm really liking this and I identify with this. Like my work isn't about being queer, but I've come to be very out in my professional life. If you want to call it a professional life, that sounds very grown up. But (laughs) I feel like the things that are at first hard to talk about maybe are the things that like help us get most free. Like if it were easy at first, it wouldn't be so free. Right. Yeah. So if somebody is listening and kind of struggling with that identity piece of like, how much of myself do I share? I think that's a really good benefit to think about. I know it's, it's going to be different for each person. There's no right answer. And I think that's a good factor to think about that. Maybe we don't always think about that, like sharing more of ourselves actually really helps us grow. Yes, grow and and really ourselves, I think, and ex- accept ourselves. Um, when, we, when you have to live out loud and kind of show the world who you are and share with people so that they feel seen too, it's just, it's like, yeah, it's like really, it gives a lot back. Yeah. So tell us about your programs. How are people working with you outside of like a traditional therapy practice? Yeah. So, I mean, even my my traditional therapy practice, I have taken down to very few clients, which I'm so excited about. Um, I just did that. And I'm hoping that I only have maybe like another year of therapy and then maybe I don't even do any more therapy and I'm only doing coaching. So that's an exciting thought. Um, So outside of therapy, which is not really open for anybody new to come in, um, because I'm trying to shrink that back, I have, let's see, I have my main program, which was initially developed with you, which was in your Create Your Program program, which is now called um, Unbox Your Sexuality in 12 Weeks. I love that. Such a good title. 
Yes. And the program, I have done, I've run the program, I would say maybe about 12 times. And I've run it at all different lengths. And I've landed on the 12 weeks as a really great length for the community piece and the cohesiveness of the group and really people forming like a a really tight knit little community of their own. So I have that program, um, which is the main program. And then I have what people, what I found was people wanted something after that. They were finished and they're like, well, now what do we do? You know, we, we don't have access to you anymore. So I built another program. You could call it a program. It's called the Sapphic Support Circle. And that has, um, well, I think after this current cohort I'm in, I'm going to need two of those, but that has about 10 people in it at a time. And that is a way to just have ongoing community and support with possible coaching from me if you need it. We meet every other week for an hour and 15 minutes. And so it just gives women an ongoing support system while they're going through whatever they're going through after having gone through the program. Again, bisexual people, asexual people, um, women married to men that are going through divorces. So really a lot of people in different places, but still very much able to be there and support one another. Mm. Yeah. So I've got that. And then I have one-on-one programs where I do, you know, um, sort of like a hybrid of um, what I call VIP coaching, which is like asynchronous coaching and one-on-one sessions that you can do over a period of three months. So two sessions a month, live calls with me, and then you have access to me Monday to Friday uh, for those three months to do VIP coaching. And how do you do the asynchronous? Like what platform do you use? So I've been using Mighty Networks for everything. Oh, nice. Okay. Me too. One thing I like, okay, I'm curious what you like about it. One thing I like about it as the coach is that all of the notifications are in one place. So as long as, as long as I don't like click on something and then not reply to it, I can't miss anything. Whereas if things are coming in through email, through like other places, through Voxer, there's a chance I could miss something. And then also I can always like see everything that's been happening. But yeah, like what do you what do you like about it? Well, I like a lot of things about it. I initially experienced it when I was in your programs. And so it was familiar. And then one of the things that I love about it is it's a place where I can have all of my cohorts in one, you know, they're all in one place. And there's, um, there's like a page for everybody, but then each cohort can still have just their own group to communicate with. So I love the setup and the layout of it. And then what I find is interesting, and this is something that I just did um, for Black Friday, and I had never done before, but I decided to do like a special Black Friday Unboxer Sexuality Bundle offer. And what was great about Mighty Networks was I was able to take one of my modules from my program, pop it into a new toolbox. Uh Uh-huh. And then just invite new people into that toolbox so that they could do that module, which was what the bundle was, plus a 30-minute session with me. And they can actually get a feel for what it's like to be in the network. So they get a little bit of a feel of what it would be like if they actually joined the larger program. But it's just like the ease of moving things around like that and adding things to a toolbox um, I mean, it just, it's like very user friendly. Mm-hmm. I feel that way too. Okay. That sounds really cool. Okay. So how did the Black Friday special go? It actually went really well. I mean, um, I ended up selling 10 of them. Um, and it was a really just like a last minute. I literally wrote the emails on the date. So I did two emails to my mailing list on Friday and did a little bit of selling on social media one email Saturday, one email Sunday, and then two on Monday. And I ended up getting people. And the first person who did their one-on-one with me ended up buying a space in my larger program that's coming up. So that's, you know, that's hopefully the idea that will work with the rest of them, which would be amazing. Absolutely. So how much did you charge? So it was $237 for a module 
which I had already, you know, was already part of my program, which included a little video lesson, a meditation, and a reflection worksheet with writing prompts, and then 30 minutes with me one-on-one for 237 which is, you know, a great price. It's really good, really good for them. And then that means, am I doing the math right? That's about like, besides the marketing and admin, that's like about five hours of your time because you had already created the module and then you made like almost $2,400. Yes. And it serves, like you said, it's not just about that $2,400 because I know you have a lot of other ways to make that, but it also serves to like help introduce your work to people or help them like step further into it and like test it out. So that's really interesting. Yeah, that was fun. It was a little strong, but it was fun. <laughs> what was the most stressful part? Um, kind of writing the sales emails, like to pitch something. Um, I mean, I don't love Black Friday, you know, in and of itself. So it was just a little bit hard to kind of push the sales. But I found that I was actually pretty good at it. And I think, you know, really um, hitting some of the the pain points of which I know so much about personally and because I work with this population. So there's so much fear. Um, they're just terrified to work with me. And so kind of really leaning into, you know, look, we've got this one life. We've got this one time through, like, you know, um, can we lean into that? And but doing it in such a way of sharing some other people's experiences. And I don't know, it just it just ended up really like flowing out. But it was just it felt stressful to write six emails in just a couple days, like pushing this one program. Yeah. And now you have them. So you can use them again, or at least use parts of them again. Exactly. So people are afraid to work with you. I know you said this thing. Um, I love it when I catch your videos on social media. And I know you said something about like, hey, I um, end up scaring people because they think like, okay, so this is what I heard. I don't know what the wording was, but it was like, I end up scaring people because they think they have to be a lesbian, or I'm gonna like, you know, they're gonna have to be a lesbian if they work with me. And like, that's really not the case. Is that like one of the fears that people have is like, afraid of what their identity is going to be or afraid of where their life is going? Yeah, I think it's, you know, I think there are um, a bunch of different fears that people have. And I find that women that end up working with me typically are following me for quite some time before they reach out. You know, I think one thing that people, and this might be because of my handle, which is Lesbian Curiosity Coach, um, I think people tend to feel like, oh, if if I'm going to work with her, that means that I have to be a lesbian. And that's not true. Um, you know, um, I have no goal for anybody to be anything other than their authentic self. So, you know, just kind of getting that message out there as often as I can for women. So that's one fear. But I think really like the bigger fear for people is just leaning into curiosity about themselves. I think because of the way we are conditioned by society, which is sort of this, con- I call it like the conveyor belt life. Um, you know, you're born and you're, you're, you know, you're just stamped that you're straight and it's like, you just have these markers. Now you, now you get a boyfriend, now you get engaged, now you get married, now you have kids and there's just this conveyor belt, you know, then they leave the house. Now you're an empty nest. Now maybe you travel a little, you know, and, and I don't know, get along or don't get along with your spouse, you know, and, uh, you know, but it's like, it's sort of laid out for you and people feel kind of. In some ways, I think a little bit reassured by that, that they don't have that many choices. Like, this is just the path. They're just going to do this thing and they're going to belong and everyone's going to accept them. Even when that doesn't really fit them that well and they have to really disconnect from themselves to do it, they still do it. And so in my program, which is unboxing, it's unboxing your sexuality, but it's really like unboxing yourself from all of that. Women are really scared to find out who are they? Because they've lived a life of just pleasing everybody around them and just trying to fit in. And they really don't know who they are. And so it's like, 
it's just terrifying. The idea of change is terrifying. The idea of um, possibly changing their relationship style or possibly separating or, you know, their family won't accept them, their community won't accept them, whatever it is. It's just that change is very scary for people. And so they shy away from doing this kind of work, which would help them just really find who they are. And then they can do what they want with it, but they just are afraid to even find who they really are. Oh, that makes sense. It's so much better over here, but like, I I totally get it. (laughs) Why that's so scary. Oh, man. Mm -hmm. So how, okay, you said something about feeling really excited that so much of your work life is over in more the coaching realm and so much less of it is therapy sessions. What makes you excited about that change? I mean, so many things. Um, I think this particular... Um, niche that I um, chose to work in is just, it's sort of like I kind of suffered for a really long time, I would say. Um, You know, after coming out, I mean, it was amazing to come out and and to be myself, and I wouldn't take that back for anything, but it was just, I had like a particularly difficult journey. My kids were very young and whatnot. Um, and there were just so many years where I was just like, oh my God, like, why am I, su- like, why, why do I have to suffer this much? What is this for? Like, there has to be something. And it kind of feels a little bit like this coaching is the answer to that. So it's like very full circle. So, I mean, I am so emotionally and energetically connected to this work that I'm doing. It's like my life's mission. It's it fills me up in a way. I mean, I love helping people in therapy too, um, and it's been 15 years of amazing work for me. Um, I love my clients and all of that, but it's very different than this this work, which it's so like the excitement I have over the transformations that I am watching these women go through when they are coming into themselves and living their full selves out loud. It's 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 like this full energy flow that is going out of me, going to them, and then coming back to me. And it's just like this real cycle of energy moving back and forth. And it just fills me up more than anything. It's so cool. Attention. If you're a therapist or healer who wants a lucrative business model where you get to do what you love, but you don't have to be running session after session after session and still barely making enough money, I have an offer for you. I want to invite you to check out my 10-week program called Create Your Program. You'll learn how to design and launch your own pilot program. If you don't know what that means, don't worry about it. I will teach you how. Head over to rebeltherapist.me slash create to learn more and register. Let's get back to the episode. How does it impact things like your schedule to be moving more and more and more into coaching? Well, I think, you know, I'm very used to the therapy schedule, which is I know exactly what time I'm going to be working and I know exactly when I'm going to be off. And I have to say, since I did create your program up until now, I would say I've probably been working seven days a week for the last number of years. Yeah. um, You know, not doing therapy per se or not doing like coaching, you know, with a human seven days a week, but my brain is on all the time. I am always thinking of content and new ideas. And, you know, so I think it's affected my schedule. Um, I was out to dinner with my daughter the other day with a friend of hers and her and the friend's parents, and my daughter was talking about me doing this coaching and the sexuality coaching, and she said, um, my mom never goes out. <laughs> she works all the time. <laughs> and it was really funny to hear that from her because it was a mirror, and it's true. Um but it doesn't feel like that to me because I have so much joy from the coaching. But it did get to a point in about October where I realized I can't keep this up. I have to make a change. And that is when I raised my therapy prices and I 
um, took my therapy practice down by, I don't know, about six six or eight clients. And I now have like 10 to 12 clients at a higher fee. And I'll see how, how long that lasts for. But I think a difference is just also with the therapy, it's very clear exactly when I'm going to be working. And with the coaching outside of my sapphic circle and my unbox your sexuality program, the rest of it is like, it's a little bit more difficult for me to figure out, to structure it and to not have it just flow into like whenever, because I I feel inspired whenever. And so it's hard to like, it's hard to be like, okay, this is the hour I'm going to find inspiration and create content, but I don't work that way. Yeah. Okay. So then when you're creating your videos, let's say, do you create those when you're inspired or do you have time blocked off to do those? Like, how does that work? Yeah. It's like fully just like I could be literally walking from my bedroom to the living room and I'm like, oh my God, I have to do this video right now. <laughs> I just do it. So it's completely unstructured. It is in the moment I could be out walking my dogs. You know, sometimes I take notes and I have ideas of things or people will ask me things. So I will have those written down and I know there are videos that I need to do to answer questions people have. But it's pretty much whenever it comes to me, there isn't any structure around it. Okay. I'm going to come back to asking you more about that in a couple of minutes. That's really interesting. Okay. So how much does your unbox your sexuality, how much does that group program cost the participant? Yeah. So that 12-week program is $2,997. And we all know like this is recorded now. That doesn't mean that price is going to always be that price. Um, mm-hmm. Okay. Very cool. And like what – is your ideal number of participants at a time? Right now, 10 is really a beautiful mm-hmm. number. Mm-hmm. And what do you like about 10? It's like just a good balance between number of people and like number of voices and time for each person or what what makes that a good number? It kind of just feels it's – it's enough people where it really has like a community, even though it's a, it is a small group, but it has a feel of like a little community. And also, you know, some of the sessions people miss because 12 weeks is a long time to show up at the same time every week for some people. And so sometimes with 10, there might be seven, you know, because three people couldn't make it or whatever it is, but it's still enough people where you feel like there are enough people there to really hear different voices and different experiences. How do you, when you think about this program now compared to the first time you ran it or the second time you ran it, how different is it now? I think it's more robust, I would say. It feels like a robust program to me. Um, people are like, oh, I'm going to miss the live call. So, uh, you know, I'll be away this date. So I I don't think I could do it. And I'm like, oh, it doesn't matter if you're away because you're getting all these different parts um, that you can do on your own. I mean, most of them you do on your own. You still have access to the cohort page. You still have access to work with me one-on-one through the asynchronous coaching. I use Loom for that, you know, text or Loom also on Mighty Networks. Um, And I've added meditations in for all of the modules. Um, So, you know, it's, it's because I started out, I started out initially doing it for five weeks. And then I think I tried seven weeks. I tried eight weeks. I might have tried six weeks. Um, And I just went around and around and landed on 12 weeks because I kind of break it down into three phases, And the phases are unpacking, unlearning, and then relearning. I use um, the IFS, Internal Family Systems, um, method to work. um, That's what you work on through the modules. So the meditations are IFS-inspired. All of the work that you are doing is IFS-inspired, which is parts work, which I just find huge transformation for every person that goes through this. Um, no matter what, because working with your parts is a way to free up your self energy, so you actually can be more authentically yourself. So it's it's really a powerful, experiential, robust 
you know, program. And I think since the beginning, I've been building it. And now every, every single module has a meditation. And yeah, it just, it's, it's changed over time. Did you, or do you do, like, how long have you been doing IFS? And like, did you get officially trained in it? Or how did that come to be? Yeah, I mean, the first time I heard about IFS was when I was in grad school. Um, Richard came to speak at my grad school. And so I was just a student, but I was so turned on by the model just from him presenting it during grad school. So I knew I was interested in it. Um, And I even from just his first presentation, I used it in my work without being trained in it. But I have been trained in level one and level two. Um, And I you know, I'm going always doing more training in IFS because I just, I absolutely love it. It just, to me, it's brilliant and it just makes so much sense. So it's been a long road, I guess, you know, about 15 years um, since first introduced to it and then over time getting trained in it. How does it work in your program? Like, I know this is just a thing that everybody thinks about who are people thinking about creating their own programs. It's like, how do you credit IFS, but also like put your own spin on what you're doing? Um, I mean, I will say it's like IFS inspired. And it's I'll say it's um, it's an experiential model um, based on the IFS, IFS method, or on based on the IFS model. Um, but it is not, you know, it is not really, it's not affiliated with the IFS Institute. Um, it's not, it's not, it doesn't go through them in any way. Um, it's literally, it is my spin on it because anyway, in the Unbox Your Sexuality program, I am basically telling you what to look for in your internal system parts wise to help unpack and unlearn. Whereas if you're just doing IFS work, you're kind of just working with your own system and the parts that you have. This is the the Unbox Your Sexuality program is very directive in that, you know, people are like, I don't know how to, I don't know how to figure this out. I feel so stuck. It's like, I am giving you the questions. I am giving you the prompts and the meditations to find these parts of you that are keeping you stuck. So that's a little bit different than the IFS method, which is, you know, you're kind of searching around inside just for whatever's coming up for you. I'm kind of telling you, you know, what you're looking for. Like it's a little bit more directive, I would say, than general IFS therapy. So um, yeah, I just kind of say it's based on IFS. I love it. This sounds so, so compelling, like being guided in that way. Okay, so let's talk about marketing. How do these folks find you? Like if you think about your last couple cohorts, where are the places that they have first heard about you? I would say a lot of people come to me because of my podcast guesting. Mm, I love it. Yeah, that's that's a really big one. Um, that gets people. And I have worked with people from Germany. I always have someone from England in my cohorts, Austria, Prague. You know, I've had women just uh, currently I have someone from Australia and she wakes up in the middle of the night every week to join the program. And she just joined the Sapphic Circle for when it ends. And she's going to continue waking up in the middle of the night uh, to be part of the Sapphic Circle. So you know, most people find me, I would say the biggest is podcasts. And then after that, it's my presence on social media. Um, and also YouTube. I mean, YouTube also is a place where I get people. Um, I, I would say Instagram, but Instagram before TikTok, even though on TikTok, I have a bigger following. But your referrals from social media are more IG. I think so. Yeah. Okay. So podcast guesting, what is your process? Like, how do you choose where to pitch? Like, what do you, what have you learned about that process? The, the interesting thing is, and I, I know there's, there are so many things that I had learned with you early on, and I haven't been a great student, <laughs> to be honest with you, in some of them. So the pitching, I haven't really done a lot of pitching. I've had a lot of people come to me and say, will you be on our show? Will you be on our podcast? Um, There was a time earlier before I had 
um, you know, a little bit, a little bit of a bigger following. I mean, still have a very small following. It's very niche, but there was a time in the beginning where I was using a platform. I think it was called Podmatch and pitched. I looked for things that, you know, looked for places where they talked about relationships and sexuality and authenticity and pitched people through that platform. And I would say that was a great place where I got to really practice being on podcasts. So the first probably like six were through that. And then after that, it started, you know, I guess, I don't know, my presence on social media caught people's eyes. And um, I did more specific to coming out um, podcasts, like the Coming Out Late podcast or the Live Out Loud or the Fuck Yeah podcast. I mean, it's just people just seem to find me and just say, hey, you know, would you be a guest on our podcast? So I've been lucky in that way. I haven't done a ton of pitching. That's amazing. So if you ever decided to do more pitching, you could get even more of <laughs> a return on that on that like yes. podcasting investment. That's really cool. I also think like I went through a phase with podcast guesting when I was getting more into it where I was doing a lot of guesting on shows that probably didn't make a ton of sense. <laughs> and I'm gl- I mean just in terms of like who's listening to them, is there a ton of overlap between who I serve and who's listening to them? They didn't make a ton of sense. And I think that really just having that experience of doing a bunch of interviews was really good for me. So I think sometimes it's not a bad idea to just jump in and get started more than trying to find the perfect show. Because it also sounds like the perfect shows, in your case, found you. Yes. Yeah. And then for some people, the perfect shows aren't going to find you. You have to go pitch them. But still, like just getting your feet wet with getting on some podcasts is a great idea. Yeah. And I mean, you had said that, you know, um, in our program. And that was very, you know, I was kind of terrified. <laughs> I was like, oh, my God, I don't think I can do this. Uh, with with everything, essentially, I was terrified. So I mean, the amount of growth that I've had personally in the last couple of years is, I mean, it's mind blowing. I, I would have told you that you're completely insane a few years ago if you telling me I'd be that I'm doing the things that I'm doing now. But definitely just getting your feet wet and just practicing, getting comfortable. It doesn't really matter what the what the general theme is of the podcast. I think just getting on there and doing it, it really helps. Yeah. I had the weirdest thing happen a few years ago where one of my best friends was getting married and I was doing like a toast. And even in the toast, I actually was like singing it was like a joke song, but I was like singing. And I remember I got up there and I wasn't nervous and I was having fun with it. And I was like, what the fuck happened? And then I realized <laughs> it was all of the like podcast guesting and other kinds of presentations that had gotten me just sort of comfortable. And it was really cool to realize, okay, I've totally grown some new muscles here that come in handy everywhere. <laughs> I love that. It's so true. Um, I mean, I had never done, I had never led groups before I started my program. Yeah. And I mean, I was just contacted by somebody in the UK that has something on like women's sexuality later in life that wants me to be a part of um, a part of some big panel and, and an event. And um, yeah, it's like the fear is gone. I don't really have any about any of those things anymore, which is really bizarre because for years, I mean, even when I was a therapist and I would be in trainings or in supervision, I was always very shy and would, you know, really hate to have to speak up in the group. And I just don't feel like that anymore. So it's been amazing to grow out of that. Mm, That's so great. So, okay. I looked at your site and one thing I saw I was so curious about is you have this quiz. If I'm attracted to women, do I leave my partnership or marriage to a man? And then like take the quiz to find out. So Mm -hmm. what, like how long has that been up and what is happening with that quiz so far? Yeah. I mean, it's time to change it. Um, You know, I definitely need to change my free offers like 
probably every six weeks or something. But that one had a really far reach. I think I got, you know, another 300 people or something, 350 people on the mailing list from that, just that one. That's so cool. Why do you think you have to change it every six weeks? Um, I think just because, you know, enough people have taken it and I'm not getting as many signups for the mailing list. And I think that if I can change it out, if I can have, I don't know, like maybe three or four freebies and rotate them, I can just engage new people more easily and get new people onto the mailing list. Okay. So you've just noticed that, like you get an uptick every time you you yes. change it up. Yeah. 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 And this one got a, I mean, this one was huge. This was I probably bet. the biggest ever. Yeah. Mm. What kinds of responses have you, have you gotten? Like, have people written you about it? Yeah. I mean, people have written into me about it and, um, you know, I basically have an email that goes out to them. So the quiz itself is like two minutes long. I think there's 10 or 15 questions. And then, you know, then there's a, a long um, email that goes out with like the key to figure out like which w- – there's one of three places you'll fall, you know, which is one is like stay put. <laughs> one is like you've got some some thinking to do. And the next one is like pack your bags, <laughs> you know. Oh, my so, God. Yeah, it's it. kind of fun. Yeah, but they're all nuanced and, you know, they're all very spacious and, you know, they all give – the people taking the quiz all have like a lot of space within there to, you know, kind of accept what the answer is for them. Um, I do hear mostly from the people who are in the pack your bags category and they're kind of like, oh my God, you know, I'm, I took your quiz and I fell in this category, but like, I still don't really know what to do, you know, and the, the stuck quality is very real for women that are married. And especially if you have a family um, and you've been with someone for an extended period of time and it's just, you know, they still end up feeling stuck. But from that quiz and from the email that they get with the with the key, then they get something the next day, which offers them some exercises to do to kind of try to, you know, um, I guess just experience a little bit of curiosity with themselves about things. And I think then there's an offer for my internalized homophobia um, freebie from there. So it's kind of like a, it feeds into other um, information for them, hoping that they will be like, okay, I'm ready to do this now, you know, ready to work with you. Yeah. And then that really, especially for the pack your bags people, I'm imagining like some of them are going to be such a good fit for your work, for your paid work. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the people that, that come and actually do the program, they are pretty much always a great fit. And, um, that, I mean, the transformation, I've had this one woman who's in Austria, she was asexual for 28 years. And she, in eight or nine months, so she did the program. She did one-on-one work with me. She's in the sapphic circle. I mean, she does she does just VIP coaching alone, like month to month. I mean, she really has put a lot of work in, but holy cow. I mean, she just said a few years ago, like she would tell you you're crazy that she is where she is. She's partnered now. She came out to her parents. She's in her 50s. I mean, it's just, it's like just so joyful to see these people come into themselves and how happy they are um, just through doing this work. So it's very fulfilling. Oh, that's amazing. And just like all of that life energy that is now just like free and moving for that person. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. So, okay, we talked about your videos a little while ago, and I remember when you were in CYP, I remember you got feedback from someone in the cohort in particular saying, like, you are great on video, like, you should be using video, and you do a lot of video, and you've you've been doing a lot of video, and some of them are so funny, they're all, like, really educational, personal what has happened with your videos over the years? And like, how do you use them? How do you think about them? I know you told us a little bit about your process that it's very much like, in the moment, it's happening. Mm -hmm. But other than that, what is your process? Mm, It's a really good question. Um, I do remember that. And I will forever be very thankful. It was 
it was the gentleman that was in our in the cohort in the CYP cohort. Um, can't remember his name, but he did say that, and um, I was very surprised and shocked because he said you you're the person that needs to sell your program. Like you, just you talking about it is what will sell it. So that was a really, you know, kind of like eye opening as a high level introvert, um, was really eye opening and and terrifying. Um, and I think that I, I don't know if there's like any like specific thought behind how everything has happened. I think just over time, I've, I've become more comfortable. I use more um, different apps like, uh, like CapCut um, for my videos. Um, what does CapCut do? CapCut essentially edits your videos for you. So, and CapCut is, I guess, the same um, owners as TikTok. So it's like whatever that is. I can't remember what it's called, but it's the same. It's under TikTok. So essentially, if you use CapCut and you record a video on there, then you can hit this button where it edits, it adds the captions and it edits your video. So it takes out any ums because I'm a big um person. It takes out ums. It takes out um, just spaces you know, pauses. And so it will condense your video, make it shorter. And then they have a lot of options for captions. There's just a ton of options in CapCut for editing. And from CapCut, it will, you download it and it will directly upload to TikTok if you would like. So I've learned a little bit just about- But you can do, and I know you can do this on Instagram too, but this sounds better- you can also download it and use it for something else, right? Like another platform. Yeah. So you once you take it from CapCut and you you save it, it will, if you want to, take it to TikTok, but it will automatically put it into your photos, into your videos. And then I've also since learned that if you're going to then upload it onto Instagram, before you upload it to Instagram from the CapCut download, you have to run it through another piece of software, which is called Metafo. Metafo removes all the metadata. And because the metadata from, um, you know, the TikTok sort of platforms of which um, CapCut is part of will slow down your videos from being released on Instagram. So you have to remove the metadata, which is just very easy to do with this app called Metafo. And then from there, you can upload it onto Instagram. Awesome. Awesome tip. Okay, that's great. So then what do you do with like, do you use the same videos on YouTube? So right now I use another software called repurpose. So repurpose basically is something that you can buy where you can send your videos from any platform to other platforms automatically. So you don't actually have to do it. So um, all of my videos, for example, on TikTok automatically go to YouTube. I don't have to touch anything or do anything with them. They just all upload there automatically with repurpose. So that's another, you know, another thing that you can do. And I think my Instagrams, so I don't do all of my TikToks to Instagram. I have more on TikTok than I do on Instagram. I'm a little bit more free on TikTok than I am on Instagram. Yeah, that's an interesting one for me. (laughs) Um, You know, I'm not exactly sure why, but I think, um, I don't know. On TikTok, it's interesting. On TikTok, I don't have a lot of trolls, I would say, that see my videos when they get sent out. It's really so much in my niche. Whereas on tick on Instagram, what I found is that the same video that I'll put on TikTok when it's on Instagram and I send it out, it will get a lot of trolls and I'll get a lot of hate coming back at me. So I don't know. I'm just sort of a little bit more picky about what I put on Instagram, but everything from TikTok does automatically just go to YouTube and I don't have to do anything for that. Wow. That's amazing. Okay. And do you then, 
I feel like I'm getting nerdy about the like, huh, how do you do the YouTube thing? And I'm realizing you just said something really important about dealing with trolls that I think is actually what everybody but me is thinking about right now. So my nerdy brain is going to go there. So with dealing with trolls, what do you, what do you think about or how do you manage that inside of yourself? Like, do you like call a friend when that happens? Do you erase it? Like, do you cry? Like what, how do you handle that? Or is it just like falling off of you at this point? So I recently did one on Instagram that was a um, a stitch. It was a TikTok video, but I removed the metadata and put it on Instagram. And it was about um, like women's labia. Um, and it was the stitch was about, it was another it was like two women having a conversation, one woman talking about her labia and how she hates her labia, and the other woman saying, you know, that is because of the male gaze. And so then I stitched that and spoke to that. So I, I posted that on Instagram, and I got such a backlash from men, I can't even tell you. And, um, you know, I mean, I'm going to say like that in some ways I think – I understood their point, and some of them had really, really valid points about this, but they were missing kind of like the bigger picture of it. So for a little while, I tried to – I mean, the the bad comments, I just delete. I just block and delete. And it's just like – it doesn't – I'm just like, whatever. I mean, I don't really care. You know? I mean, there are going to be those people that have no interest, and it's, it's not going to get me upset, but it's more – I don't know. Some people have some good points and I will try to interact with them a little bit. But then when it gets heated, like I ended up turning the comments off on this one particular post because I just got so frustrated and um, and tired kind of of men commenting on this over and over again. And I just yesterday got a got a direct message on Instagram from a man saying, you know, why would you turn off the comments to this? And And this is not about like you can't blame this on us kind of a thing and oh my I gosh. blocked him too so you know i think on on instagram and tiktok for tiktok i don't get any of that instagram i'm finding that yes i will and i can turn off the comments or block people and that's absolutely fine it doesn't get me it will get me a little fired up i mean i'll i'll talk to my partner and i'll just be like really pissed off about it not personally but just about the stupidity and like the small mindedness, I just get kind of triggered. Like how, how can they not understand this? You know? Yeah. That will get me worked up, but that's good because that might give me ideas for more content. So I don't mind that. And the worst place is YouTube. So YouTube Mm. is just there. It's like, oh my God, the trolls are so bad. So I just go through every now and again and just delete the comments. I mean, the comments are just so nasty on there. Yeah. Another thing I did on on because I was a little bit afraid because YouTube is so bad was I actually changed my address that was affiliated with my um my company with my LLC because my home address was affiliated with my LLC so I I actually went and used a um, registered agent and changed my address on my on my LLC because I got almost like nervous from it, you know, made me really uncomfortable. Yeah, that's so smart, protecting yourself that way. Oh, man, thank you for taking one for the team, Samantha, with <laughs> all of this. Yeah. Mm. You are a delight. Thank you so much. And you've given us so You've just like so generously given us so much information and I love your story and I have just adored knowing you and getting to work with you. I could not be happier that I contacted you when I did during COVID, during lockdown and started the CYP program and then um, did the mastermind after that. I mean, it's like it was the start of a complete change and transformation in my life that I am so grateful for. So yeah, I mean, thank you for being you and for what you do. I really, really appreciate it. Oh, thank you, Samantha. That means a lot. All right. You can learn more about Samantha at CuriousQuestioningAndComingOut.com. I want to thank Ames Palms for editing this podcast. If you found this episode supportive, please do a couple of things. Share it with your favorite therapist or healer. 
That is absolutely the most important way we reach more people. And if you haven't already, please hit follow and give us five stars. That is so helpful to this podcast. And thank you so much for listening. I'll see you next time.